We are in the middle of a New Year's sermon series called Word Search, where hopefully you've had the time to be joining us and you've been encouraged to find a word for yourself that you wanna focus on the first quarter of this year. Now, for me, the word that I have for you all today is not exactly a word that you may see consistently in the Bible, or if at all, but it is an action that we see in the Bible. Simplify, simple. Right, in God's kind of sovereign humor, he kind of simplified our whole week this week, didn't he, right? Cleared out a whole lot of stuff. We have a simple worship experience. We even turned off the water for you guys. We're trying to stress this thing, all right? <laughs> Simplify, and guess what? By his grace, we're still okay, aren't we? See, the heart of this message is this. The world is already difficult enough, so there's no need to make it harder. But yet we add more stuff, make it more cluttered. So how can we simplify our lives for a better life. In my early years in college, I developed a really bad, terrible habit. There'd be times in which all things at once would begin to peak and my stress level would go through the roof and I didn't know who to run to or how to handle it. I'd have a major test coming up and I'd have a big race coming up on the verge. I was a, uh, an athlete there. Uh, I had financial commitments that I couldn't make and my family always had something going on that I couldn't deal with. So the bad habit was this, I would emotionally erase everything I could until I could simplify it down to one thing manageable. I would take a poor grade on the test because studying was off the table, I, couldn't, I was too stressed. I would default all my bills because I didn't have the money to pay for it, which didn't help in the long run, and so forth and so on until I had only one or two problems to work with. It's as if I emotionally just wiped the table clear so I could start new to simplify my life. Now, I wouldn't encourage you to do that. <laughs> like I said, it was a bad habit, but it's one that got me through a lot of tough times. Now, I don't know if you've ever felt this way before or if you've ever done that, but if we're honest, it's sometimes way easier to give up than push through, isn't it? And if you've ever felt that way or you're feeling that way now, maybe simplify could be your word for this year, for this quarter. So how do we clear the clutter for us to be our best selves for God, even for our kids and for parents and for the people around us? How do we clear the clutter? So let us look at the life of Jesus and see how simplifying can not only be healthier for us, but also spiritually freeing. The first thing I need to highlight about Jesus' life is this. Jesus lived simply, but he did not simply live. Have you ever felt that you're just getting by, right? Paycheck to paycheck, day to day, you're just surviving? That would be simply living. I just exist. You're doing everything you can just to stay alive. But if you desire to accomplish the thing you were made for, then you'd be one step closer to living simply. You see, to simplify your life doesn't mean making things easier, although it might do that. It means you order your life around making the main thing the main thing that you simplify to. So to simply, or to live simply, is to live daily for a specific reason. And nothing else matters, right? You clear the clutter uh, uh, to that thing, and, that, and, and everything that gets in the way, you get it off the table. So you can do what you were made to do. Even at a young age, Jesus had one thing on his mind. There was a moment when he and his family had traveled back to Jerusalem for Passover, one of the holidays, and they were on their way back, they'd already celebrated it, and then they realized Jesus wasn't with them. So they went back to town to find him, and they found him in the temple. So read with me from Luke 2, 49, his response. Jesus said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? Now this phrase can be interpreted in my father's house as it is, or it can also be interpreted as in or about my father's affairs, or in or about the things of my father. Which is why some translations say he was actually telling his parents, did you not know I have to be about my father's business? Now parents, kids, pay attention, let me see your eyes, kids. Parents, I think it's time that we give them in a little secret, all right? I'm sorry, but they have to know they're old enough, okay? Kids, especially when you were really little, if it ever got really, really quiet in the house, we knew you were up to something bad. <laughs> that was our secret. We knew you were up to something that you probably shouldn't be doing, so more often we'd go looking for you and see that you had gotten into something you weren't supposed to be doing. 
throwing toilet paper or toys in the toilet, or drawing on walls, or something worse like putting a walkie-talkie into the microwave and pushing start. True story, smelled for weeks. <laughs> Quietness, they got into something. Rarely, if ever, kids, did we go and find you cleaning your room, or, or washing the dishes, or scrubbing the toilet. No, you were into something, you got distracted. And so you were about your father's business or your parents' business if you were doing that. You were taking care of the house. You see, Jesus in his free time was always about his father's business, what his father was doing and what, what he wanted it to do. He didn't get distracted by the other things that we usually get distracted by because he was so in love with his father and he was so in love with what his father was doing. You see, Jesus lived simply. He was about one thing his father's business. So let me ask you, what's your one thing? I wanna give you a second to really consider this because I think this is the key thing missing in our lives when we start feeling overwhelmed. I heard a pastor once share a story about a marital counseling session he was having. The family, the, the husband and wife were always fighting. In fact, they were fighting in the counseling session. So he stops them and he says, let me ask you this question. What's the mission of your marriage? It stopped them in their track. They didn't know what to do. Essentially, the reason why they were fighting is because they had never asked themselves what they wanted their marriage to stand for. They had no purpose in their marriage. They didn't know if they wanted to bring glory to God through it or to something else or to bless others or even to bless themselves. Perhaps they didn't even know if raising the kids that they had toward God and loving Jesus was a part of their mission or anything else good and holy. So what's your one thing, what's your mission? What's that thing that you desire to strive for to live simply, not just simply be living? See, I want us to look at a simple prayer to instruct us how to simplify our lives. And in fact, it's the same prayer that Jesus gave us and told us how to pray. And he gave it to us, he gave these prayers to us with the instructions to keep it simple. He said, without needless unnecessary words, this is how you should pray. Read along with me, it's in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. It says, pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's the prayer, the simple prayer Jesus asked us to pray. Now kids, listen up. There's a sweet little girl who we've seen on social media who she thinks she has figured out God's name by listening to this prayer, all right? And she heard it this way, our Father who are in heaven, Howard be thy name. She thought God's name was Howard, but no. <laughs> the word is hallowed, basically saying you are holy. Your name is holy, a name above all others. So as sweet and innocent that as that is, don't make that mistake. Jesus is reminding us that when we pray to God, there's nothing and no one greater that we can be connected to in that moment. But he also shows us what our one thing should be as Jesus followers and people of God. So we need to hear this. Simplify your purpose. We're running in every direction in our lives trying to accomplish way too many things and we don't even know what our purpose is in those things. That purpose in the first line of our prayer is this, Matthew 6, 9 through 10. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our simple purpose is to focus on God's will and his kingdom being present here on this earth. Everything we do should be bringing about his will and his kingdom to the people we engage with. If our one thing is to be a God-loving parent, then how do I clear the clutter to make sure my family sees that and knows that best? If my purpose is to be successful in my job, how do I clear the clutter to make sure my successes actually is about extending his kingdom and not more excess in my kingdom, in the resources that I have? If my purpose is to love my spouse or the people around me, what's getting in the way for me to lead and love them in a loving relationship with their creator. 
You see, I believe the one reason we feel like the world is eating us alive is we're just living to get by. It's because we don't know our purpose. When we know our purpose, we know what we are here for, and we also know what to get rid of to actually simplify. So let's look at the next few lines of this prayer and see how they help us to declutter our life for this purpose. We need to simplify our possessions and provisions. Simplify our possessions and provisions. Guys, we have way too much stuff. We have simplified this weekend. You can can see we're still doing fine. God is still here with us, amen? Matthew 6, 11 says, give us this day our daily bread. You know, I don't think we have a problem with not having what we want or need. What we have a problem with is having too many things. We get distracted with too many things. Think about it, with every purchase is another commitment. And a commitment is to either use it and or to clutter up something in our lives, our space, or even our mental capacity. Some of us would be better off with fewer clothes, fewer toys, fewer distractions. I mean, think about it. If we have less clothes, it means less laundry, amen? (laughs) Less detergent, less appliance use, less money to spend on electricity, so forth and so on. It simplifies things. But we end up getting so many more clothes because we want to improve somebody or impress somebody that we don't even know and like. We don't need it. Regarding toys, look at this perspective. Kids, pay attention. A child who has too many toys ends up eventually coming to the parent and telling them what, parents? They're bored. But a child who only has one toy, they end up playing with that one toy until it's broken beyond repair. And even then, they may take it with them everywhere. Why? Perhaps it's because they understand the value of having that one thing and not concerned about having abundance. See, when we acknowledge that God is our daily provider, we don't get so worried about tomorrow and adding more to our stuff because we trust that he has taken care of us to this point and he will take care of us in the next day too. All right, so we can take those possessions and even give them away to extend his kingdom to those in need because we have the abundance. Simplify. All right, that's an easy one potentially, right? Clear the extra possessions and trust God to provide for you daily because he will. The next verse of this prayer is a little harder though. Remember, simple doesn't always mean easy to do. We need to simplify our care for people. And sometimes that people can be caring for yourself. Right, Pastor Rufus said saying no may help saying no to toxic people. Maybe that's one way you care for yourself. But we have to understand that God has placed us around people every day in our life, and that is not by coincidence. So how has God placed us in this life around our neighbors, our friends, our kids to care for them? Matthew 6, 12 says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. All right, take a deep breath. Because some of us are living distracted because we're living in sin. I said it. I said it, we're living in sin. I'm not trying to beat you up. We do that, we do a pretty good job of that all on ourselves. But if we're not being honest with ourselves, we're holding on to sin in our life that is not the way that God intended for us and we feel burdened and bogged down because we're chasing a life that was never designed for us. But some of us would feel a freedom in this life if we laid our ways down at the cross. We don't know the kind of love and freedom on the other side because we're too distracted and clinging to the clutter of our sins. Bad relationships, unhealthy addictions and desires. Sometimes it's even the little sins, right? Some of us are hiding sin in our life that we don't want anybody to know about and it's eating at us every day. Let me tell you this. The cross is the greatest thing that ever happened for that kind of clutter. God tells us that our sin is at the cross and when it's there, it's cast far away as east is from the west. We never get to see it again. He is clearing the table There is no sin on the table when it's put at the cross. Jesus dines with us there. This is the kind of forgiveness here for you when we ask for forgiveness of the Father through Jesus Christ. Jesus reminds us of this. But if we think that's hard, take another breath. Because some of us are living day to day carrying the weight of anger and hopes of revenge because we can't forgive someone who has sinned against us. 
Let me read this quote from you. It's an it's a, uh, old pastor, Frederick Buechner, old minister. And he says this about anger. He said, of the seven deadly sins, anger is possibly the most fun. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past. To roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come. To savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain you are given and the pain you're going to give back. And in many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. But the chief drawback is that what you are wolfing down is yourself. The skeleton at the feast is you. Guys, forgiveness of others is more about you than it is those who have sinned against you. They're going about their lives perhaps and they're still living rent free in your head as founding pastor Craig Strickland would always tell us. To forgive doesn't necessarily mean to forget. It means you've given it to God and he will handle the verdict. Some of us need to kick some people out of our minds and forgive them by putting them into the hands of God so we can live more freely and simplified for his purpose. That's hard. But you wanna talk about freedom, give it to God. Another place that Jesus simplified this for us is literally summarizing the whole law and all the prophets said. Listen, all the prophets said and all the whole law, guys, that is this portion of the Bible. He simplifies it in two simple things. All right, it's in Matthew, let me make sure I say this correctly here. Nope, that's a different one. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. He simplified the whole first half of the Bible. You know, when we simplify our care for people, we actually simplify faith to the main focus. Love God and love others. Pastor Rufus said this last week. It says love God and love others. It doesn't say love God or love others. So each day we can simplify your care for people by asking these two questions. And if you're a parent, these might be a good dinner time question just like Ch uh, Cheney asked this morning, or maybe even a bedtime question. How did you love God today? How did you love others today? By doing this, you get to simplify the measurement of success of each day by pursuing these things. Not because you're required to do them, but because you love God. And guess what, if you feel like it's getting too complicated or you did one over the other, or you didn't do any of them at all, you can go back to the prayer. What's it say? Forgive me of my sins, Lord. The cross is big enough for that. Okay, so this last one is going to require a little discipline. May not be as hard, but it still requires some discipline. We need to simplify our plans. We need to simplify our plans. Guys, we are way too busy, too, we work too hard, we add too many things to the schedule to even care for the things that are most important in our lives. Matthew 6, 13 says, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now to me, this portion of the prayer at best is asking for protection from sinning. And at its least is also asking to help us not to get distracted in our purpose. See, for many of us, this is a simplifying of our schedules, right? Now, I'm about to share a very unpopular opinion, so here it goes, you ready? Some of us are going to have to get rid of some habits and or hobbies so we can fulfill our purpose better. Parents, you might need to not commit your kids to so many things. If it's getting in the way of what you desire for them to be children of God or in your family. Or we might need to remove things from our homes that are distracting us from being our best for God. So what is it? What's that habit, that hobby, or even that thing that keeps getting in the way? I'll go first, you ready? It's my stinking cell phone. Every time, I say this every year. Man, just throw in the trash. The science is out there, people. Listen, we are distracting ourselves to death. Hours upon hours in this doom scroll, right? My wife and my family recently purchased this thing called an Aero Box, A-R-O, right? It's a Bluetooth box that you place your phone in and let it charge out of sight. You know, kind of like that old thing, the landline. <laughs> <laughs> it then notifies you how much time you spent on your phone or off of your phone and lets you assign what you did with that time that you got back. Now, you may not need this. You might be good at putting your cell phone down in a way 
when you get home, but my wife and I are not. I know we're not the only ones either, right? It's really easy for us to get sucked back into the warp hole of the doom scroll. I can go on and on about what that looks like. We've experienced it. So we purchased this thing because we recognized the thing that was getting in the way most in our home, either between us or between us and our kids or even the things around the house was our cell phones. We want to build better habits for us and our kids around cell phones and screen time as we try to present ourselves as better parents and healthy parents for our kids. So we told them when we put our phone in the box, which is often, we are either doing one of two things. We're focusing on them as kids or we're doing chores around the house. It has been a huge simplifier for our home. We have played more with our kids. We've done more things around the house. And guess what? My wife and I actually like each other. Amen? (laughs) We did before, but we can see it even more now. We need to clear the clutter from our lives, the possessions, simplify how we care for people. We need to clear our plans out to focus on what our purpose is. So we measure it by simplifying our purpose in God's will. Ask yourself, what is it that God has purposely made you to do? And simplify your life toward it. If it is a better parent, what's getting in the way? Clear the clutter. Find a better routine around the house. Make the hard choice to remove some things and live simply for God. It won't be easy, but it will be the main thing. And it puts the main thing as the main thing for you and your family. Now, I have assumed one great thing during this entire sermon that I need to make sure I take time for. The context of the sermon assumes you know God has a great plan for you. And it also assumes that you want to bring glory to God. But what's at the heart of wanting to simplify things? For me, we simplify to find his rest. We simplify to find his rest. We're not just simplifying because we want less to do or life is too hard, but odds are we're tired, right? We're tired of the rat race of life. We're tired of the pace that the world is forcing us to run. We're tired because we don't feel like it'll ever get better. You ever feel that way? We have a deep ache in our hearts and bones to rest. So let me ask you this. Whose pace are you running? Who told you you had to run this pace or needed to work this way or were only valued if you had these things or did these things? Who told you this? That question echoes in my head because that is the same question Adam and Eve were asked after Satan deceived them. They told God, we are naked so we hid from you. And God asked, who told you that? Guys, we are being deceived at a pace that was not designed for us. It is not healthy for us. We were given for Sabbath to rest in God. You see, we have a rest in a relationship with God that gives us hope and confidence when the enemy still kills and destroys. But if we have forgotten this, or perhaps don't know that we can have this relationship with God through Christ, we may feel the burden of this pace in our life. This is the thing that was at heart when Jesus shared this hopeful message in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. And this is out of the message version, I love it. It says this, are you tired? You worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me, watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Oh, I want that kind of rest. Jesus is the only way that can show us how to simplify our life for the purpose that God has made us for. Our sin gets in the way, our habits get in the way, our schedule gets in the way, because we've forgotten that God has made us for his glory and to enjoy him forever. He offers the opportunity for us to lay everything down at his death and he buries it with him. And in his resurrection, he brought us back a clean slate. One that's not cluttered with the sins of this world and the things of this world, but one that brings us into his rest, his hope and relationship with our creator. So for me, I simplify so I can be the best person God has called me to be and to always find my rest in him and nothing else. And if you feel like this is something you desire as well, We're gonna have prayer leaders come up after the benediction to pray for you 
They can pray specifically for that and even if you want to know more about this Jesus man in your life so that we can experience him and his rest that he offers. So what's your purpose in this life, right? What are you here to live for, to work for, to parent for? Does it bring love and praise to God? What's getting in the way? See, I hope by remembering this prayer, you can simplify your life to experience the beautiful rest in God and be better for it. So to close, we're gonna keep it simple. If you know the prayer, please join me in praying out loud the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We love to pray for you and celebrate alongside you. Please share anything going on in your life with us at hopechurchmemphis.com slash prayer and subscribe to the Hope Church Memphis YouTube channel to experience previous worship services and more. Have a great week.